Welcome to Pursuing Justice. It's good to have you join us today. I'm Harriet Hendel, and our theme for the next few weeks is going to center around a very unique play. This particular play is very close to my heart for several reasons. Back in 2017, when I was a board member of the Innocence Project of Florida, it was my idea to bring it to Florida Studio Theater in Sarasota, Florida, as a benefit for the Innocence Project of Florida. The play was written by an amazing couple, Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen, way back in 2000. They have written a fascinating book called Living Justice, which I just finished, and the book is subtitled Love, Freedom, and the Making of the Exonerated. Reading it felt as if I were on the road with both Jessica and Eric in their intense quest to find men and women who had been sent to death row, but were eventually deemed innocent of the crimes for which they had been arrested and charged. Erica and Eric and Jessica had met shortly before taking on this project and soon after got married. They will be my guests for the next three podcast. Their deeply moving play has been produced in many states here, but also has been done in Dublin, Edinburgh, London, the UK, Japan, Mexico, France, China, Thailand, Iran, and Italy. Very impressive. Of course, I want to allow Jessica and Eric to share the many experiences they had as they drove across the country meeting each exoneree and listening to the details of every one of their cases. Just for a moment, though, let's explore the origins of the death penalty in our own country, which dates back to 1608. Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin opposed the death penalty, and Pennsylvania was the first state to ban public executions. And in 1847, Michigan abolished the death penalty, except in cases of treason. 22 states have outlawed the death penalty, and over 100 countries have also done the same. Right now, there are 2,620 people on death row in the United States. However, 170, 170 have been released from death row and exonerated. What if that had not happened? and their execution had already taken place. Here in the Americas, the U.S. is the only country to carry out executions in the last 11 years. The state with the most capital punishment is Texas. In 2005, the Supreme Court ruled on a case that was called Roper v. Simmons, which now bans execution of juveniles. This means that if an underage child committed a serious crime, the death penalty as a sentence is now unconstitutional. 366 children who were juveniles at the time of their offense were indeed executed in the U.S. prior to the Roper decision. Here's something Justice Stephen Breyer said in 2019, and I quote, As our nation comes to place ever greater importance on ensuring we accurately identify through procedurally fair methods those who may lawfully put to death, may be lawfully put to death, there simply is no constitutional way to implement the death penalty. Around the globe, China leads with the most executions, but we have no idea of the exact number. Other nations who use capital punishment in large numbers are, in, or, in the order in which they use them, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. I have mentioned the National Registry of Exonerations to you before. Um, they, there, it's a wonderful website. I encourage you to take a look. 
They tell us that as of February 2020, for every 50 people sentenced to death from 1973 to 2017, one has been exonerated. So are you thinking, how does this happen? How can a person be accused of a crime he or she has not committed And by using flimsy evidence with overzealous prosecutors at the helm, incorporating jailhouse snitches, shoddy counsel, critical evidence somehow disappearing, and a media firestorm which has created public bias, all of these factors add up not just to a wrongful conviction, but a death sentence. As I read each story, as much as I am familiar with cases of wrongful conviction, I was still shocked and speechless that this really does occur. So how can the stories of the exonerated be told? They certainly could have been portrayed as a narrative by an actor. They could have been merged into a composite of several different people. But what Jessica and Eric chose to do was to record all their interviews with the many exonerees they met and weave the exact word along with trial transcripts into a play. In their book, Living Justice, I learned that after an execution in all 50 states, evidence relating to the case is destroyed and the case is closed forever. But in the state of Texas, there was a man put to death whose name was Cameron Todd Willingham. I recommend a movie which was made about him called Trial by Fire, and it starred the wonderful actress Laura Dern. It seems quite clear that Willingham was innocent. The film came out in 2018 and is well worth watching. He was put to death in 2004. The crime was arson, and his children died in the fire. There's also a documentary about him called Incendiary. As I read through each encounter Jessica and Eric had with each exoneree, I was struck by the and the differences of each of their, their stories. Here, here's just one example. A man named David Keaton. David lived in a small town near Tallahassee, Florida. He was about 50 years old when Eric and Jessica met him. But back in 1979, he was 18, a high school senior. There was a terrible robbery gone bad of a local grocery pulled off by three young black men. They held two police officers hostage, but in the end, one policeman was killed. The robbers took off with the money. Naturally, the townspeople wanted to find the man who had committed the robbery and also the shooting of of both policemen. Nearly every young black man was considered a suspect and was questioned. Ultimately, David Keaton was interrogated, even though he had never been to that grocery store. There was no hard evidence that the authorities had against him. He was questioned for days. He wasn't permitted to have a lawyer with him. His mother was not allowed to be with him either. This is illegal, especially for a juvenile. The questioning lasted nearly a week. By then, it was too late. David felt he might be killed or beaten up and that nobody would be the wiser. He was pressured into confessing to the crime. He made a decision to do that, reasoning that the eyewitnesses to the crime would surely know he was the wrong suspect. That's not at all how things turned out. The eyewitnesses were nearly all white. None backed him up after he refuted his false confession. With no physical evidence against him, the jury convicted him and he was sentenced to death by an all white jury. David suffered in prison, largely due to his age. At 18, he was placed in solitary 
for 23 hours a day. He spent two long years on death row, and even though his religious faith was strong, he was deeply, deeply scarred by those years. What I would like to do now is share um, one other story from Living Justice, um, and I'd like to read from the book uh, that Jessica and Eric wrote. The man's name is Bo Cochran. In 1976, an AMP in Homewood, Alabama, was robbed. Bo told us that he had been at the scene of the crime. He was leaving the AMP when the cops showed up. They surrounded the store and they shined their lights on him, he said, and out of instinct, having been, having been beaten and threatened so many times by cops, he ran. Bo was still running about a half a mile away when he heard a gunshot. Just minutes later, the cops caught up with Bo and hauled him into the station. After questioning him for some time, he told us, they brought him to another room and locked the door. The detectives told him to strip. He took off his jacket and handed it to one of the cops. He bent down to untie his shoes when he heard the cops say, look what I found in the jacket. Bo looked up. The cop was holding a wad of bills, reportedly about $250, wrapped in an AMP rubber band. Strangely, Bo had been searched three times previously that night and the only money they found on him during those searches was 32 cents. But, Bo told us, after the detective discovered the bills on their fourth search, Bo wasn't surprised when they charged him with robbery. But then they told Bo they were also charging him with murder, and his jaw dropped. He heard that gunshot, but figured the cops were firing in the air to try to apprehend him. He had no idea someone had died. The cops told Bo that the white AP manager, Stephen Ganey, had been killed just after the robbery and that Bo was the only suspect. Bo, represented by a public defender who was allotted $1,000 to try his case, was brought to trial and quickly convicted of capital murder on no physical or eyewitness evidence by a jury of 11 whites and one black. When he first got to death row, he told us he was deeply depressed. He wouldn't talk, he wouldn't eat. Things looked hopeless for him. But on Alabama's death row, unlike most death rows, inmates are not isolated from each other 23 hours a day. They actually get to interact. And this, Bo said, is what saved his life. The other guys kept talking to him. They wouldn't let him isolate himself. Finally, Bo started talking. And then he said with a laugh, I talk so much they were after me to shut up. The other guys lifted him up, Bo said, and he started hanging out with them in the law library. And he then started using that time in the library to teach himself the law. Bo was one of the victims of Alabama's unique policy of not guaranteeing inmates' lawyers after their initial trials. Like the vast majority of people on death row, Bo was extremely poor and had zero access to an attorney after the state quit providing him with a public defender. Even though the law guaranteed him several more appeals, he had nobody to argue them. His knowledge of the law was improving, but not enough to argue his own case against the DA. He started writing letters to anyone who might possibly help him. He wrote to the ACLU, the NAACP, everyone, but Bo looked guilty and nobody would help. He knew he didn't kill Mr. Stephen Ganey, though, and he didn't give up. He told us he kept on studying law. 